Pastor Josh Dockstetter here from Center Point Church in Montague, Prince Edward Island. Thank you for viewing this sermon from one of our weekly worship meetings. I do hope that it will encourage and challenge you towards a maturity in Christ. We at Center Point believe in the local church, and we want to remind you that this sermon should only support the role and influence that your pastor and church family should have on your life and not replace it. If you aren't a part of the local church, I want to simply say, don't rob yourself of the presence of others in gospel community, and don't rob others of your presence in gospel community. Find a church that preaches the word of God, makes much of Jesus, and is committed to discipleship. And may the following sermon enrich you in the gospel for the glory of God. If you're out in the foyer, we'll call you back in uh, to take your seat, and uh, we'll ask that you will grab your Bibles. Um, we believe in the Word of God here, and we stand firmly upon it, and so we would ask that you would, uh, that you would take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel. Today is a very exciting day because we are starting a series in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, very exciting. This year we're going to be looking at the life of David. And so uh, 1 Samuel is very key to understanding David. And uh, what the plan for this year is to walk through 1 Samuel, hopefully finished before uh, summer sometime. And then we're going to look at the Psalms of David over the course of the summer. And then we're going to pick up 2 Samuel uh, in the late summer into the fall. And uh, then we'll arrive at Christmas, if you can believe that, yet again. Uh, so we're trying to keep things organized and keep things planned out. Um, so I want to encourage you, if you can, um, something even just my wife and I were talking about is how, how often we come to church expecting that, uh, you know, just to approach the text that was going to be preached for the first time at that point. But I want to encourage you to read 1 Samuel. Uh, you know we're going to be spending time in 1 Samuel over the next couple of months. But I want to encourage you to spend time reading, and even reading before you come on Sunday, to read the Word of God and allow that to sink into your heart and mind so that you can actually interact with it a little bit more uh, when I stand up to be able to preach, that you can think through things, that you can uh, figure out how to apply so that you're not just hit with it on Sunday morning, but you've been thinking throughout the week. So I want to encourage you to consider that. Apply that, and most importantly, getting into the Word of God is one of the, I would say, one of the most important, if not the most important things that we can do as believers here um, as a church. So we're looking at 1 Samuel today. Uh, we've got a lot to cover uh, in this little, uh, well, not so little book, but um, we're going to read 1 Samuel 1, starting at verse 1, and we're going to go to all the way to chapter 2, verse 10 today. So we got a lot of reading. We've got about 38 verses to get through. Um, we're not obviously going to take them verse by verse, but we're going to do more or less an overview. Um, so we're going to read it at the beginning. It will be on the screen behind me. Um, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Um, and so if you have an English Standard Version, it'll look very similar. If you don't have that translation, um, that is okay. You're welcome here, of course. Um, and uh, we're going to read uh, the Word of God here this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 1, starting at verse 1. There was a certain man of Ramathim Zoph Zophim, oh man, I'm, a, I'm having a hard time already, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zoph, the Anephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man, that is Elkanah, used to go up year by year from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave her a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. 
And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in, the, in, the, in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your, to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along, I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, go in peace. And the God of Israel grants your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him, only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him, and when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli, and she said, O oh my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap and he makes them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them will he thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. 
he will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. This is God's word. May he bless it. May he add meaning to our lives because of it. Let's pray. God, you have spoken, and we are here to listen. So God, open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears, open our very lives before you. That God, we might see in this passage the Messiah, the King of all, Jesus Christ, the Savior. And Father, I pray that you would be lifted up on high in our midst today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so excited to begin this series with you on 1 Samuel. I know we've just taken uh, quite a while to get through the last passage, but this passage today is so rich, so full of, of just divine wisdom and divine goodness, and so full of the gospel most importantly, as we look at today. We're going to be looking at 1 Samuel, as I said, over the next couple of months, and our theme for 1 Samuel is on the heart. We're going to be examining the heart. As you walk through 1 Samuel, we're going to be examining the hearts of, of a bunch of different characters. There's going to be a lot of character studies, such as Samuel and Saul and, and David, of course. And we're going to look at the heart of these men, but we're going to also, most importantly, see the heart of God revealed to them and through them and towards them, and that in so doing, our hearts might be revealed. And so our hope as we move along through 1 Samuel is that we see the heart. We understand not not simply a physical organ, but the entirety of our lives as it pertains to our God. And so we're going to be comparing and contrasting different characters. As I said, Samuel, Saul, and David, the first seven chapters are fixed on this guy, Samuel, and his role, his, the importance of his role in Israel. And so today what I want us to see in the text that's before us is that God makes the invisible visible. God makes the invisible visible. The Bible points out to us that the pr- presence, the nature, and the activity of the invisible God through his sovereign works. That we serve a God that we do not see through human eyes, but yet when we look around, we can see his works. His works of creation, his works of providence. God who is sovereign, who is the authority over all things. And that's what I want us to see today, that even in spite of the circumstances we face in our lives, God is at work. God is at work. And God in his works puts his heart on display that we might know him, and that our hearts might be on display, that we might know ourselves. But there's a problem we face. It's, it's, it's evident within the passage through a bunch of different characters, but there's a problem that we face here today is that what's often in our hearts determines what it is we see most prominently for good or for bad. That is, like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that we've looked at last year, I can't believe I'm saying last year to 2019, but last year where we, set, we looked at where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And in the same way, where our heart is, and the Bible, how it views the heart is essentially the seat of a person, where their whole life is at rest, where their life is rested. And so where they put themselves, what they, where they seat themselves, what their perspective is on life, what their viewpoint is. What is in your heart will determine what you see most. What you set your life on will determine what it is that is most visible in front of your eyes. Where your heart is located is what you will see most. So I ask you today, is your heart seated to see God Almighty? And if, it, if that's so... Today, you're going to see that God works humility into our lives. A key feature of a heart that's surrendered to God is humility. 
God works humility into our lives through the heart that we might see King Jesus. And so we begin this morning by not looking so much at Samuel, but rather at Samuel's family, and specifically Samuel's mother. She is an example for us because she points us to Jesus. She points us to Jesus. And so we're going to look at Hannah this morning as an example of humility. So we start chapter 1 and is basically a story. It's a narrative. It's, it's telling what has happened. And it's interesting that we understand where that story and when that story has taken place. The two previous books to 1 Samuel is the book of Judges and the book of Ruth. Now, it's important that we notice that at the end of the book of Judges, in Judges 21, verse 25, the book of Judges ends like this. It says, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Judges is one of those tragic books. I mean, it's full of heroes, but you'll notice that as you begin in the book of Judges, those heroes are doing well, but eventually these heroes just get worse and worse and worse, and because Israel is getting worse and worse and worse, and in moral decline. They're in the promised land, and they're just not getting it. They serve God for a while, but then they fall into idolatry, and they mess up. And a judge rises up to deliver them, and then they fall into idolatry again. And it just keeps going on, this cycle. And so it ends with, there's no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And then we encounter the book of Ruth, which Ruth gives us a background for the great-grandmother of King David. Ruth is essentially a book of hope in the time of Judges to say, God's at work. God's at work, and he will bring his king. He will bring his king. And so Ruth is setting the stage for a king, even in the midst of the time of the Judges. So in 1 Samuel, we begin by meeting this man, Elkanah. Now, because of the long list that uh, the writer of 1 Samuel gives to us, it it implies that that Elkanah was a respectable man. He was a well-respected man. You you can see he's got uh, his um, lineage there. And we're going to see throughout the uh, chapter that he is a respectable man. Now, he had two wives. Polygamy was something that was common. However, it's interesting to note that the Bible never puts polygamy uh, or views it in a good light. While it was something that was common culturally, it shows, as we see all throughout Scripture, when a man has two wives, it ends up bringing strife and conflict. So husbands, be thankful for your wives. (laughs) Just something we can, amen, yes, I know, we can be thankful for that. So we ought to keep those things in mind that just because something is stated in the Bible does not mean the Bible views it in a positive light. If anything, it shows the opposite. And so we see Elkanah with these two wives, Hannah and Penina, or Penina, and you'll notice how, they're, how it's structured in verse 2. It speaks of Hannah first, then Penina, and then Penina, and then back to Hannah. It's trying to get us to see Hannah prominently. The writer of, of 1 Samuel is trying to get us to see Hannah prominently. And it notes, it, it gives us a characteristic of Hannah and Penina. Hannah had no children. She was barren. Penina had lots of children, had lots of children. Now, barrenness is a common theme in the Old Testament. We actually see it in a number of cases in in the Bible. Sarah, Abraham's wife. Rebecca, Isaac's wife, went for a period of, I think it's 20 to 30 years before she actually had children. Rachel, Jacob's wife. And Manoah in the book of Judges, who's Samson's father, his wife, Manoah's wife, was barren. And then we get into the New Testament and we hear of Elizabeth, right, who was well-aged before she had John the Baptist. And so barrenness is a common theme. But did you notice those women that I mentioned? Did you notice their role in redemptive history? Did you notice that these barren women seem to be God's instruments for raising up key figures in the history of redemption? That that through Sarah, Isaac was brought forward, the promised son. 
And through Rebecca, there was Jacob. Through uh, Rachel, there was Joseph. Through Manoah's wife, there was Samson. And through Elizabeth, there's John the Baptist. So here we have numerous patriarchs. We have a judge. We have uh, leaders of Israel that are brought forward from what seems to be impossibility and absolute nothingness. And isn't that how God works? That God creates something from nothing. From the very beginning, from Genesis 1, we see a God who takes nothing and fills it up. And so in our emptiness, in, for these women, their barrenness, God fills the void. And we're going to see that here in 1 Samuel. God begins in our greatest need, in our total inability, in our nothingness. We must see this because this is the beginning of the gospel, is it not? that we are trapped in sin and there's nothing we can do to get out of it. And that's where God begins. That's where God works his salvation. And so we look at Elkanah's family. We see Hannah. We see Peninnah. Now we arrive at, at verse 3, and it's important for us to notice Elkanah as contrasted to another character that we're introduced to, and that is the character of Eli the priest. In verse 3, we get this idea that Elkanah is a faithful man. That is, he is someone who loves the Lord and is obedient to the Lord. He would go up year after year sacrificing, and he would lead his family in the worship of the Lord. Now, that might seem insignificant during what we might think of as Bible times, but it actually is very significant at a time when as I mentioned, Israel's in moral decline, and also even the priesthood was corrupted. Because as we're going to learn, Eli is essentially the opposite of Elkanah. The opposite of Canaan. He was neither submissive to the Lord, and neither did he do a great job of leading his family, as we're going to learn about Hophni and Phinehas, who were these wicked priests before the Lord. And so here, the author of 1 Samuel is trying to foreshadow something, that Elkanah's family, Elkanah is walking with the Lord, being obedient, leading his family, and Eli, who's supposed to be, as a priest, is not, is not. And so then we get to verse 5 where, where it says Elkanah gives a double portion to Hannah. He specifically loves Hannah more than Peninnah. Now, the double portion is essentially the leftovers of the sacrifice. They would take whatever they might be sacrificing, an animal, and they would slaughter it, and they would offer it to um, the priests at the temple for sacrifices, and what is left over is given to the family that they might have a sacrificial meal together. And you can see here that Elkanah, Elkanah, his love for Hannah, but in this very verse, verse 5, we're given insight to why Hannah is indeed barren. It's not necessarily because of any physical means, so to speak. It says because the Lord closed her womb. Now, that's very difficult for us to understand in our perspective. It says the Lord had closed our, her womb. But what the writer of 1 Samuel is trying to get us to see is that if God has closed it, he has a purpose in doing so. He has a purpose in doing so, and there's a purpose that is yet to be completed. That he will not just leave Hannah in that barrenness. There's a purpose that is yet to be completed. And as, as we get more insight into the relationship between Peninnah and Hannah, we see that Peninnah was obviously very proud of her children, She's very proud of what she was able to offer and very jealous of Elkanah's love for Hannah in so much that she would provoke her. And think about that for a moment, ladies. You have to live day after day after day with it just in your face, what someone else has that you want so desperately, but you are unable to. See, even though Hannah had the love of her husband, even though she, she, it seems like uh, Elkanah was a respected man who was godly, who uh, was wealthy, we can take from that. Even though she might have had everything, she understood, true, that she was trapped in nothing. She was trapped in nothingness. And, 
And we see Elkanah's, even her husband's unhelpful words. But I, I want to just highlight verse 8 for you if you, can't, if you can notice it. Elkanah, her husband, tries to comfort her by saying, Why do you weep and why do you not eat and why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Now that phrase, more to you than ten sons, is actually really interesting. Because if we look back in the Old Testament, there was another case where a woman, I've already mentioned her name, Rachel, was barren, and she had to live alongside her sister, who was also Jacob's wife, and Leah had many, many children. And do you know how many children Leah had before Rachel had any? Ten. Ten. She had ten children, and at that point, Rachel then conceived and bore a child. And so even here, the author of 1 Samuel is trying to get us to see, see, read in between the lines to see that God's about to do something. God is about to do something here. Even through Elkanah's unhelpful words, he's foreshadowing what is about to come. But first, we see Hannah's heart. Hannah is so bitter, so sorrowful, that she goes to the only place that she believes she will find comfort, that she will find a listening ear, and that she, is, she runs to the temple, the temple in Shiloh. And in this passage, in Hannah's example, we get a series of firsts in the Old Testament. First of all, she's the first woman, so to speak, in the, in the Old Testament that runs to the temple, that flees to the temple, knows that she, if she's to find any comfort, if she's to find any hope, it will be before the Lord. She is the first woman to, to make a vow and to fulfill that vow. And she's also nowhere else in the Bible before this passage do we hear anyone referring to God as the Lord of hosts, which is what Hannah prays here. Notice that it says Hannah prays out of the bitterness of her soul. Anytime that word bitterness is used in the Bible, it's essentially referring to the fact that human comfort won't do. We need something greater. We need something divine. We need something, some kind of comfort. We need some kind of encouragement that comes from divine intervention only. And you'll notice the humility of Hannah's humble vow in verse 11 and following. In verse 11, I guess it's just verse 11. Hannah's humble vow. Notice how many times she says, your servant and how many times she acknowledges God as the Lord of hosts. She makes this vow saying, Lord, if you will give me a son, he will be yours all of his life. It's important to notice that aspect of a vow because we think of a vow or requesting things from God means that we get, that we get, that's merely just about taking from the Lord. But we see here, that Hannah understands that making this vow is not just taking, but rather giving out of what has been given. Giving out of what has been given. And of course, there's that embarrassing moment that follows where Hannah is praying, pouring out her heart before the Lord. And Eli the priest, again, this is going to show us a contrast between Hannah and between Eli now, as opposed to Elkanah and Eli. We're going to see Eli's insensitivity. He essentially is like looking at Hannah, pouring out her soul before the Lord, thinking, there's a drunk woman. Now, it often, you know, sometimes it's very telling, our thoughts, our reactions, as to what is normal. And what I mean by that is it showed what Eli often dealt with in the temple. As I said, Israel was in moral decline. It probably was a familiar occurrence to see people drunk in the temple, which is probably why Eli's mind went there. You notice what he experienced constantly, what he faced in the worship of the temple. And so he assumes, he presumes upon Hannah this drunkenness, and Hannah says, no, no, it's, it's, it's not this. I'm pouring out my heart before the Lord. You'll notice Eli's insensitivity, his blindness to see what's actually going on. In so much, there's almost a pun when Hannah says, 
uh, at the end when she says, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Later on, we're going to read that Eli gets blind. And it's essentially a physical manifestation of what is going on in his heart. That he was blind spiritually far before he was blind physically in what was going on. And so even in this, we see Hannah's great faith in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of her circumstances. And we read that the Lord, she, she is encouraged. She said, Eli says, go in peace. The God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And you'll notice what Hannah does. She, in verse 18, then the woman went away her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Even before she received she had faith. She was comforted by spending time with the Lord. And we read that when they went home, Elkanah knew his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Now, that does not mean that God forgot. Anytime in Scripture it says, the Lord remembered so-and-so or a person, it's not implying that the Lord forgets as we often forget, and then remembers, oh, right, I, gotta, I remember that person. Rather, what it's implying is that God is about to work. God is about to work. The Lord remembered her. He is taking action. And he does so by providing for her the promised son. And so we've read about Hannah's need. Now we see Hannah's gift. We see Hannah's gift that she conceives and bears a son and calls his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. I have asked for him from the Lord. Now, there's often a tendency, if humility is not present, to just think, great, I got that gift, I can keep it. There's a tendency sometimes to think, this is mine. I possess this gift. Uh, it is mine to hold on to it. I've asked for it. I've longed for it. I've wanted it so badly. I have the right to keep it. But that's not Hannah's attitude at all. That's not Hannah's attitude at all. We notice that Hannah is carries through on her vow to present Samuel, that she, meaning that she has given, she's giving what has been given back to the Lord because throughout that whole occurrence, throughout that whole event, Hannah has received something far more than just a son. She's received, as we're going to read later in her song, an understanding of the Lord God, which is far more valuable than 10 sons. I mean, do you notice? We're going to get into chapter 2 in just a minute here at Hannah's song. Do you notice how many times she mentions son or Samuel? <laughs> she goes on about the Lord because what she's asked for, God has come through tenfold, a thousandfold, in that he's replaced her desire for a son with a desire for him. He's actually grown her heart to see greater things. And we read the remainder of chapter one where Hannah waits until Samuel is weaned. Back in those days, it was about three years old before a child was weaned, two to three years old. And then she would take him up to the temple to sacrifice. And not only would she offer her son, so to speak, as a living sacrifice, that is, as she would offer him to the Lord, she also brings along uh, an ephah, we read, of flour and a three-year-old bull. A three-year-old bull. Now, these were costly things, which shows that Hannah's offering is not simply done as a sacrifice, but also as an act of thanksgiving. She was thanking the Lord for what God has given D.F. Payne remarks on Hannah's sacrifice, her intention on giving. He's a, he's a theologian. He has wrote this. He said, God had given him, that is Samuel, Hannah gave him back. 
And Samuel's very name was a reminder of these things. We should not overlook the sacrifice that was made by Hannah, but her loss, her loss was Israel's gain, for she felt amply compensated. Here we get a glimpse of the reality of what God can do even when little, so to speak, is given. Even when what seems to be a small little circumstance, when it's handed over to him, when it is used as an opportunity for worship and for service and for obedience, God is able to make great things happen. You see, little is much in the Lord. Little is much in the Lord. God had greater purposes than simply just giving Hannah a son. She had greater purposes to use this son to bring about redemption history, to be a leader for Israel, to implement and to raise up kings. And that was Samuel's purpose. He was to be, he was to be a prophet, a priest, a judge in Israel, to lead Israel to the place where the, when they wanted a king, Samuel would direct them to the right one. And through Samuel, we are able to get a clear line of sight to Jesus Christ. And so in this, we see not just Hannah's need, not just Hannah's gift, but we see Hannah's obedience. And this shows how God works in our lives. God lifts our eyes. He moves our hands. And he he shapes our hearts to greater things that we often don't see in the moment. Things that begin as smaller things, God is able to use to accomplish his great purposes. So that means every faithful word, parents, you say to your children, every loving touch a husband might have towards his wife, every prayer offered to the Lord, no matter how long, no matter how short it might be, how God is able to use those things to transform lives and hearts and accomplish his purposes. You see, this story is, let's be honest, in light of the rest of the biblical story, it's a small story, but it accomplishes great things. It's a small story that accomplishes great things where God shows himself at work where God makes the invisible visible. And in so doing, we, we uh, encounter in chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, the song of Hannah. Just as chapter 1 is a story worth telling, the song is a song worth singing. And actually, we owe a lot to Hannah in our study of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel because in her song, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, Hannah outlines the major themes of 1 Samuel. Hannah outlines the major themes of 1 Samuel. We get the story in poetic form. This is Hannah's heart bursting into song, into praise, into thanksgiving for what God has done. Now, you'll notice that this is one of the last mentions of Hannah. We get another glimpse back to her. These are some of the last words from Hannah. But they are wonderful, powerful words that fill the rest of the pages that we're going to be looking at in 1 Samuel. Hannah's song expresses insight into God's workings and it presents the entire theme. It sets the tone for the book of 1 Samuel and its significance is immeasurable. There are three things from Hannah's song that we can understand, broken into three sections. The first is this, God exalts the humble and brings down the proud. God exalts the humble and brings down the proud. And we'll notice that verses 1 to 3 speaks of Hannah's specific situation. What what has happened in her life, what seems to be small and insignificant to other people, is incredibly significant to God. Because it says, my heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. Because he's heard me. It's because he's, he's paid attention to his servant. 
And then secondly, the second aspect of Hannah's song is that God is working in spite of human evil. Hannah knows that very well. In spite of what's going on, even in in the temple, in Israel as a nation, God has not abandoned his people. God has not abandoned his people. He is working in spite of human evil. Hannah takes it up to another level. She moves from her situation to see Israel as a nation, that God is at work on a larger plane. We see this in verses four to eight, where Hannah is constantly showing how God provides for the humble, for those who have need, and he brings down those who are proud in heart. And then lastly, we reach verse 10. What a powerful verse to end on. What a powerful way to end her song. Hannah says, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them will he thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. That word anointed, if you translate it into Hebrew or from the Hebrew, it is the word Messiah. It is the word Messiah. That's what the word Messiah means, anointed one. God will give strength to his messianic king. So all throughout Hannah's song, we see God exalts the humble, brings down the proud. God is working in spite of human evil. And how he will accomplish all of these things is that he will raise up his king and his anointed messiah. And so Hannah's song begins on this very uh, specific individual plane, but becomes this big, wide, historical, redemptive history perspective that God is at work even through the little things to accomplish his redemption, to accomplish his work, that God will raise up a true king. God will reveal himself visibly, The invisible God will become visible. The path of the song is this ever-increasing significance of the invisible made visible. It goes from Hannah's experience to the way Yahweh rules to how it will be when God fully, completely, visibly rules. Now, how does this fit with the entire book of 1 Samuel? Well, we're going to see these themes pop up constantly in 1 Samuel. We're going to see in Samuel, Samuel rising to a place of authority through humility. And we're going to see Saul rising to a place of authority, God raising up a king for Israel. But Saul, becoming proud in his heart, will be brought low. And yet, in spite of being brought low, God is at work in exalting someone else who is humble, and that is King David. And we see these these ebbs and flows of these different characters where they're honoring the Lord and they're humble in their heart, but they're then being brought down because of the pride in their heart. And all throughout, God is at work. And all throughout, God is pointing further and further to his Messiah, to the Lord Jesus, the one who will come to save his people from their sins. And in so doing, we can see that Hannah, Hannah herself, points us to Christ. Something that is presumably so far away in time, in respect to time, yet so close to her in faith. Should that not be the case for us? That though we might think, oh, Jesus dying on the cross was so far away from where we are today. Or Jesus returning might be so far away from where we are today. Hannah's example is God has not abandoned us. He is still close. Humility, like such as Hannah's, enables us to see through the thick of circumstances to see a holy God at work. So you might feel like you're in darkness. You might feel like you don't know what's going on around you and you're out of control Humility, humility of heart, understanding your greatest need 
is not a change of circumstances, but rather a change of you in your circumstances. And that only the Lord God can give you that. Only the Lord God can do that. And so through this song, there, it becomes a greater song. God makes the invisible visible. And what I read for you earlier at the beginning of our service together is Mary's song, the Magnificat. It's actually very, very close. I would dare say that Mary, Jesus' own mother, had a good understanding of Hannah's song. Because if you read the Magnificat, it's, there's some lines that are almost identical the themes are there of humility, of proudness, of God raising up his king and filling the hungry with good things. So we see Hannah's influence pointing to Jesus, the Messiah. Friends, this is what God delights in doing, making the invisible visible, and he does this with himself. God works humility into our lives that we might see the king, King Jesus Humility understands need, humility understands giving, and humility understands obedience, just like Hannah did. It's like what John the Baptist says in John 3.30, he must increase, I must decrease. That's true humility. He must increase. Because when God is, when you're so full of yourself in your heart, you have no room to put other things into it. But if our hearts are filled with the Lord, friends, we decrease, he increases. And that's exactly what humility is. Humility doesn't stand still long enough to examine itself. Humility doesn't stand still long enough to admire itself. Humility is the nature of a servant. It's not just, just lying down. Humility is action. Humility is taking the nature of a servant and the one who exemplified that most to us is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ is the humble servant. He sought not his own glory, but he sought the will of his Father. And because of that, God raised him up as the anointed king, the Messiah, his father glorified him for his obedience and humility. And so Hannah's story of humility, of sacrifice, of patient, fervent faith reveals the one who is truly king. Friends, where your heart is located determines what you, must, what you see most prominently in your life. Charles Spurgeon once said, when a man admires himself, he never adores God. When a man admires himself, he never adores God. Humility ought to reveal Christ to us and in us to the world. So friends, take upon yourselves the humble state of a servant. Recognize your need. Recognize that to yourself you are lost in sin, but in Christ you are a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the example of Hannah, and we are thankful, God, that you have worked in and through her to reveal Christ to us. And Lord, I, I pray for those here today. There are many who face affliction, there are many who find themselves in the thick of a fallen world. And to many, to many others around them, they might seem invisible, or their circumstances might seem invisible. God, you are aware of our hearts. You search our hearts. You search our circumstances. You know what is in us. Oh God, I pray that you would humble us, that we might be lifted up, that we might understand that God, all we have is Christ. Jesus is our life, our very life, our very hope in this world. 
And so, Lord, remind us afresh, remind us anew. Though the world might discourage us, though we might fail ourselves, God, you are faithful and you are worthy of our praise. You must increase, we must decrease. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.